online afterwards. Um, so if you, I, I know that's a very frequent question, you will be able to go back through this at your convenience in about a week or so. We are also going to be doing a Q&A period at the end of today's webinar. Uh, you will notice down at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A panel. We encourage you to use that to submit questions for our panelists and presenters. Um, don't confuse that with the chat panel. They look similar. The chat panel has a single, um, speech bubble, the Q&A panel has two speech bubbles. Questions go in the Q&A panel. If you're having technical issues, that goes in the chat panel and I will be keeping an eye on that. So if you're having any chat, uh, any technical issues, use the chat panel. Otherwise, questions go in the Q&A panel. All right, with that, I will hand it over to Ariel Drehobel uh, from the US Department of Energy, who will introduce uh, our agenda and speakers for today. Ariel? Thank you, Harrison. All right, um, before we jump in and get started, feel free if, um, for all of the folks joining us today to please introduce yourself in the chat. Please put your name, your organization, and what you're interested in learning from our conversation today about community engagement and innovation in community solar. We're really happy to have you here. So feel free to add that in. Um, and good afternoon, we thank you for joining us for the fifth of our six webinars that the National Community Solar Partnership will be hosting this summer, where we'll be highlighting projects that encompass the meaningful benefits of community solar. My name is Arielle Drehobel and I work in the solar office supporting the National Community Solar Partnership. And I am extremely excited to be hosting this webinar today with all of you and continuing this conversation today around authentic community engagement and innovation with our incredible panelists. All right. So jumping forward to the agenda, uh, while everybody is introducing themselves in the chat, this is uh, an overview of how our conversation is going to flow today. First, I'll be sharing some brief context on the National Community Solar Partnership. Then we'll hear uh, from our webinar moderator, Michaela Gonzalez, Program Director at the Initiative for Energy Justice, who will set the stage around energy justice, authentic engagement, and community solar. After that, we'll hear from Evan Ramsley with Bonneville Environmental Foundation, Emil King with the District Department of Energy and Environment, and Ingemar Matheson from Northwest Arctic Borough, who will share brief overviews of several community solar projects and a state program that have excelled at developing projects with authentic engagement and innovative outcomes. After which, we're going to have some time for discussion of those topics and other projects within our uh, panelist portfolios, as well as for questions from the audience members today. Um, feel free at any time to add a question to the Q&A box, and we'll um, aim to get to it at the end of the webinar during Q&A, or the panelists will respond to your question if they're able during the webinar. All right, with that, let's dive in. So to set the stage for today's conversation, I want to highlight um, and emphasize, again, the opportunity for community solar nationally, as well as where uh, we currently are in terms of um, access and innovation within the industry. Through a recent study from NREL, they found that about half of all households and about half of businesses are not able to host solar PV on their roofs due to a number of barriers, which means that community solar really can be a great option for accessing the benefits of solar energy for many households within the United States today. In order to build towards a more equitable energy system, we really need to ensure that community solar is more widespread and accessible to all households. And that's the goal of the National Community Solar Partnership. We at the National Community Solar Partnership aim to support stakeholders on community solar through um, these three areas listed here. So our market data and analysis, our online community platform, and our direct technical assistance program. If you are not yet a National Community Solar Partnership member, I welcome you to please join us on our online platform where you can apply for technical assistance, engage in peer learning with other stakeholders, and find available resources from the Department of Energy and our partners. Um, my colleague Anna just dropped a link in the chat for you to register. This slide provides an overview of the work that the National Community Solar Partnership is currently focusing on in order to build towards our target to enable enough community solar by 2025 to power the equivalent of 5 million households. And what's especially important, I think, too, is to achieve deep savings and meaningful benefits, um, which are listed on this slide. 
Um, and we have more information about all of these initiatives on our website. This is a little bit more about our meaningful benefits. So these are the outcomes that we are looking to achieve through our work at the Department of Energy. Um, and you may notice that there are a few things that are not listed here that we're gonna be talking about today in this webinar, such as authentic community engagement and other innovative practices that go even further and beyond these five areas of benefits. Um, and that'll be the focus of today's discussion. Um, and then lastly, before I hand things over to Michaela, I want to highlight that the panelists for today were all recognized by the Department of Energy's 2022 Sunny Awards for Equitable Community Solar, which awarded community solar programs or projects that incorporate meaningful benefits. So um, we're going to be talking about these categories of community engagement and impact today. Um, I'll also flag that the 2023 round of the Sunnies closes in two days on July 14th. So get your applications in soon if you're planning to apply. Um, and now I'm going to move the conversation towards our topic for today, namely strategies for ensuring that community solar projects and programs include authentic engagement and meaningful benefits for participating households. Leading this conversation from here on out is gonna be our moderator, Michaela Gonzalez, Program Director at the Initiative for Energy Justice. I will pass it over to you, Michaela. Sarah, and thanks everyone for joining today. Um, just a little uh, intro on IEJ. We are Initiative for Energy Justice. We're a, a small staff nonprofit that provides law and policy resources to both advocates and policymakers working to advance uh, equitable transition to renewable energy at the state level. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the, our four um, panelists today. Um, before we get in, into um, the, the example projects, I wanted to go through some ways in which we understand energy justice and equitable community solar projects. So I borrowed this fantastic graphic from our friends at Energy Equity Project that runs through four pillars that, that we use to describe energy justice. So when we talk about um, recognition justice, um, we're referring to honoring affected communities and individuals in decision-making processes and addressing the difference in needs between various populations, um, differences in needs and power imbalances. Um, secondly, procedural justice refers to meaningful participation in the decision-making process so that may entail adjusting decades old processes and procedures to ensure more transparency and participation. Uh, thirdly, distrib distributive justice would help to address the disproportionate impact of pollution on fence line communities, as well as to develop opportunities specifically for, um, for disparities, to address disparities in energy affordability and access. Uh, and then this last pillar on restorative justice is looking at ac acknowledging and mitigating damage that's been occurred over time. Um, and, you know, sometimes we look to Indigenous scholars that have a very advanced understanding of restoring balance, um, not just in um, uh, economic or environmental terms, but also in restoring balance in relationships uh, among humans or, or non-human relatives as well, and incorporating principles of self-determination and sovereignty. Um, there's another frame in which we also describe equitable community solar. Um, this is on our on the next slide. Um, we use three um, three definitions or three areas to describe equitable community solar. Um, one is simply that the project uh, benefits multiple customers. Uh, from there, community solar projects vary significantly in how they're structured and what their benefits are. Um, so the next two would be uh, uh, thinking back to the distributive justice pillar on the last side, um, equitable projects should be designed specifically with and for communities that have faced the highest economic, environmental, health, and social burdens. And lastly, uh, governance and ownership often yields the most control 
over design, siting, development, construction, benefits, who benefits. So, um, so that's also an, an important element. Um, in terms of authentic community engagement, I will allow our panelists to speak more to those definitions and examples of what that looks like. Um, so I will turn it over to um, our first panelist, uh, Evan Ramsey at Bonneville Environmental Foundation. Great, thanks so much, Michaela. Um, and thanks to DOE for organizing this discussion today and for inviting us to speak on our work and um, some of the projects that we've been advancing over the years. Um, it's great to be with everyone today, a very impressive panel and uh, cast of uh, attendees as well. Um, next slide, please. So I'm Evan Ramsey, I'm the Senior Director of uh, the Renewables Program at the Bonneville Environmental Foundation. Uh, BEF has several different program lines, as you see here. We really focus in the areas of energy, carbon, and water. Um, we also have an energy education program that works with educators uh, around the country, and we deal in environmental products like uh, renewable energy certificates. Um, next slide, a little bit more about our renewables program. Um, we're about a 25 year old nonprofit and we're fairly unique in the sense that we're very project focused. Uh, a lot of environmental nonprofits might be um, in the advocacy space. We really value the learning by doing. And so we do that through these um, project focus areas. We work very closely with our utility partners and these are partners primarily in the Pacific Northwest. We were originally created uh, to complement some of the goals of the Bonneville Power Administration. Uh, they're the hydropower marketing uh, agency, uh, federal agency, and they serve a lot of the um, consumer owned utilities in the Pacific Northwest, cooperatives, public utility districts, municipal utilities. So we will help those utilities advance their renewable energy goals, whether it's community solar, biomass, low impact hydro, other technologies. Um, we've also expanded over the years into electric vehicle programming, uh, assisting our utilities and, and the communities they serve with uh, vehicle electrification. We've done a um, number of tribal renewable energy projects over the years and um, have been really honing and expanding our focus on benefiting low-income households via solar um, over the past eight or so years. Next slide, please. Uh, Sunward is how we describe this work of expanding access to low income and disadvantaged communities, um, expanding access to and benefits from renewable energy, primarily solar. And we're really focused on the, the economic benefits and the wealth building opportunity that it can bring. And we do this through partnerships. We are always building partnerships, um, new, existing um, and we're building projects with these partners. So um, we are rarely doing uh, projects ourselves alone. It's always with uh, one or many more partners at the table helping to design, create, and, and deliver these. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Next slide, please. So what we do, uh, this is a smattering of community solar projects that we've advanced over, um, over the years, some with tribes, some with utility partners, and some with community-based organizations. Um, you know, what we do is we really try to fill gaps in, in uh, what the partnership needs. Uh, in some cases, we need to take on a, a more leadership role or manage a lot of elements to a project. And in some cases, we're really in the back seat or behind the scenes, uh, simply providing uh, advice or technical assistance or funding. Even um, we do provide grants to some of our partners to help them achieve their goals. Next slide, please. Um, and this is, you know, a slide just designed to illustrate um, the partnership aspect. You know, it's, it's very core to our work in, in our renewables program, but really across our entire organization. And, you know, this slide is 
uh, a cast of partners um, dating back maybe five years ago, I, I probably could have uh, a dozen more slides like this with all of the partners that we've worked with over the years. So um, it's it's really core to how we operate and um, you know a, a big part of the meaningful benefits and engagement that I think we're we're talking about today. Next slide, please. Um, so again, thanks to DOE and the uh, National Community Solar Partnership, uh, we've been involved with this program for quite a while. Um, this was a challenge that was ran about five years ago, and we organized some of the partners you saw on the last slide um, to really try to create some innovative models to deploying uh, solar. And you know, we set a, a challenging, uh, ambitious goal to do the first of many things. And we were successful in some cases and, and learned some hard lessons in others. Um, but just to highlight a few examples here, um, we were able to do one of the first uh, solar projects on USDA subsidized affordable housing in, in Oregon. And you know we didn't quite realize all the meaningful benefits we would have liked, but um, getting USDA to approve uh, essentially including solar into the budget of one of these housing properties was, um, was a big win in, in our minds. We also advanced one of the first community solar projects in Oregon on affordable housing uh, complex. And um, we tried to utilize the DOE's weatherization assistance program funds for this project. I believe it would have been one of the first to utilize uh, that funding program. Unfortunately, we had to pivot and move away from that funding source um, given we couldn't get the income qualifications uh, done to a threshold in order to qualify, um, but we got very close. Uh, project is commissioned and, and built with uh, other funds that were utilized there. And then the, the Saginaw Mobile Home Park was a, a great example of a partnership with the um, People's Utility District. It was Emerald PUD in Oregon. They implemented a virtual net metering program voluntarily uh, for nonprofits like St. Vincent de Paul to utilize in this case. And so um, we we're very proud to be a part of this project and enable one of the first mobile home community solar parks uh, in, in our region, at least. Next slide, please. So th this was a project that um, we helped to submit to the Sunny Awards uh, last year. And, you know, I don't want uh, BEF to take the, the credit for this project. It was not really our project, but um, an important collaboration here. Um, the project is owned by the Hart Butte School, um, which is actually a public school located in um, uh, Western Montana. And um, this was a collaboration between uh, Hart Butte, Grid Alternatives, uh, the Blackfeet Community College was involved, um, and the utility here, the Glacier Electric Cooperative, was, was very supportive. Um, this school is uh, it's a public school, but it serves primarily uh, tribal residents of the Blackfeet Reservation. Uh, we encountered some challenges in that because the school was not technically a tribal entity, they weren't able to apply for or access some of the uh, DOE's funds that are dedicated for tribal renewables. So we had to get a little creative in how we were going to deploy the project here. Um, and we were able to leverage some of BEF's uh, grant funds and contributions, some of uh, Grid Alternatives, Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund, um, and pairing these funding sources together with the utilities um, support in doing virtual net metering, we were able to serve uh, immediate uh, households in the immediate vicinity of this Hart Butte School, which is primarily um, tribal enrolled uh, members um, and, and tribal students that attend that school. Um, grid alternatives, you may be familiar, they do great uh, workforce development and um, on the job training for any volunteers that want to participate. And, you know, great outcome of this project was two of these Blackfeet community members um, transitioned into permanent jobs with, with grid alternatives after the project. Um, our energy education, CE, um, also has worked closely with um, uh, providing a fellowship to a local educator uh, to develop renewable energy curriculum uh, at the school there and in the community. So uh, really hoping that this project is, um, you know, first step in a, in a long journey. And I think uh, the Blackfeet Community College is looking to expand solar in the community and um, has really 
uh, energized uh, the Blackfeet Reservation, uh, pun intended. There's a great uh, New York Times article uh, as well that mentions the project. Next slide, please. Um, so just to address some of these questions, and maybe we'll get into this in the Q&A, but you know, what does innovation and community engagement mean to BEF and the work that we do? Um, you know, a lot of it is, is in the innovation space is really just about money. How can we pair dollars, resources, incentives to projects to maximize uh, benefits long term to these communities, to these low income households? That's really a core focus uh, of ours um, and a, I think a good place for a nonprofit to be uh, directing our resources towards. And then you know, what does community engagement mean? Um, you know, the, the theme of our work is really partnership. And so um, not all partners are equal and equally resourced. And so when we are working with partners, we really try to take that into account. Is it a large utility that has, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue? Or is it a small community-based organization or a small um, rural uh, partner that uh, does not quite have the resources to fully engage with us or, or in a project. And so we try to keep that in mind and resource our partners appropriately. Um, and then, you know, having patience and longevity is, is a big part of, the, of um, having success. These projects are difficult. They, they take a long time, at least in our region. Uh, and so, you know, being there um, alongside partners for a multi-year period is a really important um, approach. Next slide, please. Um, just wanted to take this opportunity to, for a quick plug here. There's an EPA webinar going on right now, but um, BEF is really interested in um, advancing these types of projects in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Um, we're doing outreach right now to see if there are other partners in this region that are looking um, to bring those funds into these states. So please reach out to me if uh, you're interested in coordinating. Um, we're, we're hoping to do some outreach and, and planning uh, for these funds very soon. And I believe that wraps it up for me. Um, so I will kick it either to Michaela or, or to Emil. Thank you. All right, thanks, Evan. Uh... So I will keep it going. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks again to DOE for uh, allowing the district to uh, participate. Um, I think we've been engaged with the National Community Solar Partnerships since the very beginning. And it's a, a wonderful uh, opportunity if you're not a member to learn some really awesome things um, that are going on across the country. Again, my name is Emil King. I'm representing the District of Columbia's uh, Department of Energy and Environment. Uh, we are the uh, state energy office, essentially, for the District of Columbia and uh, manage everything from weatherization to energy efficiency programs, uh, electric vehicle policy, et cetera. So very wide ranging um, suite of interests. So uh, next, please. So uh, in the district, um, there are essentially two ways to go solar, um, solar for all and market rate solar. So today I'll be talking a little bit about solar for all, which is our um, low income or income eligible uh, community solar uh, program that has a small uh, rooftop single family uh, aspect as well. Next, please. So what is solar fall exactly? Um, well, it aims to bring the benefits of solar energy to 100,000 uh, low to moderate income families in the District of Columbia. That's by December 31st, 2032. So we have uh, a little bit of time left to accomplish this goal. Uh, the Department of Energy and Environment is partnering with a variety of organizations uh, throughout the year um, and across the entire District of Columbia to install solar on both single family homes and to develop community solar projects that, that benefit um, renters and residents in multifamily buildings. So that was the, the genesis of this, uh, of this initiative was to, again, expand the benefits of solar to a extremely large population of, uh, of renters and residents of multifamily uh, housing. So uh, essentially anyone that's participating in this program 
I should expect to see roughly 50% annual savings on their electricity bills for periods of 15 years or more. Often that's uh, 20 years in, in some of our uh, projects. Uh, and they can also be very proud to have uh, gone solar. So that's solar for all in a nutshell. Uh, next, please. Uh, so who do we serve through this program? Um, so again, our agency manages uh, weatherization funding. So we have about 22,000 households that are served through, uh, through that program. And what we attempt to do in every opportunity is to pull off as many of those households as we can uh, and um, hopefully get them enrolled in Solar for All. Uh, at, at present, we have about 165 or so uh, community renewable energy facilities. That's what we call them in the district, uh, solar farms, community solar farms, um, that serve more than 6,000 low to moderate income households. Um, that number is always growing, and the crux of our activities are essentially to, to grow the number of households that we can serve. So that's about 6,000 of the roughly 22,000 um, that are primarily eligible for, for this program. Um, the subscriptions are sized to provide uh, net metering credits that offset about 50% of the annual electric um, utility bills. And that, so now we're currently about $520 in savings uh, per year. And we're always trying to adjust that to make it um, more closely aligned with actual, um, actual energy consumption and, and cost expenditures. Um, household income must be demonstrated to be at or below uh, less than 80% of the area median income, and that's based on household size. Uh, for example, a household of one, it's about $80,000 um, uh, for our region, so a little bit higher than some other places, um, but um, these are, you know, mandated uh, requirements for us. Uh, next, please. So as far as, as funding, that's one of the questions that a lot of people have. Um, we've been really fortunate to have uh, quite a bit of funding for this program, which began in 2016. It's a, a district council a legislative mandate to develop this program. Um, and so we developed it in partnership with uh, stakeholders through a, a task force that had 13 members representing the solar industry, affordable housing, uh, LMI groups as well. So that was a year long process that that sought to understand how we could leverage our funding streams, which essentially come from the district's RPS. Um, there's a, an established a non compliance fee for any energy suppliers that fail to meet um, solar energy purchase requirements each year. So those funds then come to our agency and it's put into a special purpose fund called the Renewable Energy Development Fund, called REDF. And that supports the development of all solar for all projects. And then there are opportunities uh, for federal funding that we also uh, leverage to complete some of those projects as well. So the DC Sustainable Energy Utility, which is under contract to DOE, uh, also provides a capacity-based incentive that's capped at $1.25 um, per watt. And that, uh, in, that contract actually supports the vast majority of solar for all projects. So the DCSEU puts out uh, an RFP every year, developers bid um, and they propose a rate that they would offer and they identify host sites. We pay the incentive and those host sites, uh, all of the electricity comes back into our program to be distributed across our portfolio of projects. Um, then uh, the, the developers tend to uh, couple those incentives with federal tax benefits, uh, SRECs, et cetera, to cover all of their costs. So in the district, it's very lucrative um, for a private developer to develop a solar project as well as a solar for all project. So win-win in, um, in that regard. Next, please. So as, as far as outreach and engagement is concerned, um, we had a really big challenge initially with um, the disconnect between some of the higher income communities that were first adopters who were banging down our doors to get access to funding to support solar. Uh, meanwhile, in, in our uh, lower income communities, there was virtually zero interest and we had to actively engage and find uh, partners that were willing to host projects and, and get some you know, understanding on the ground for what all of this stuff was. Um, so our three main challenges at this point and what we're always working to address uh, are customer acquisition, site acquisition, and subscriber management. 
Um, so as far as customer acquisition, you know, nothing is free. What's the catch? You're with the government. What do you need? What do you want? Why are you here? Um, solar is still considered a new technology for many people. A lot of people don't understand it. There's a, a ton of community mistrust and distrust um, regarding the government and anyone offering, uh, you know, free things for you. And then there's also market confusion, confusion and the prevalence of scams, um, particularly for some of our older residents who are receiving offers to install free solar panels, which is exactly what we do as well. So there's a lot of work that goes into differentiating our products versus others that may not be um, so good for, for homes. Uh, the second site, site acquisition. So District of Columbia, a uh, fairly small city, geography limits the large systems that we would love to do to scale. So that's one issue we're constantly um, exploring uh, ways uh, to get around. Uh, property types have may have limitations on different uses. Uh, property owners' timelines, development cycles for a dispensing of a property or developing it into something else. So we are always on the hunt with the SEU and with our RFPs to find sites, suitable host sites for our, our systems. And then lastly, subscriber management. Um, how do you keep subscribers engaged? Again, over 6,000 uh, residents or households that are part of our program. How do you keep them coming back? How do you keep them happy and understanding what's going on, understanding their benefits and how they can tell their friends and neighbors about the program um, as well? So some, those are some of the main things that we're um, specifically looking to address uh, as the project continues. Next, please. Uh, so again, so as far as community engagement, this is just a list of, of our primary partners. We have many um, and you, you hear of a lot of these organizations, uh, you know, all the time in this space, but Groundswell handles a lot of our um, engagement with the households as far as subscribers are concerned, and they manage that the, the customer journey from sign up to understanding questions about billing, etc. Uh, DC Solar United Neighbors, or SUN, uh, provides a lot of informational events that feed um, uh, households into our program. They also coordinate solar uh, purchase uh, cooperative buying opportunities. And the we have iChooser, which is partnering with them. The DCSCU uh, has a workforce development program as well. So projects that are coming online uh, with the for the program uh, can actually receive uh, training opportunities. Um, so ultimately, many of our projects are built in community-centric locations that are churches, multifamily housing, et cetera. So we are always engaged um, with those host sites to, to further um, empower residents and, and get people, uh, more people signed up. Uh, next, please. So as far as, a, here's a couple examples just of what we're putting out. Solar for All, what's the offer? Here's a one-pager that, that we... Um, that we offer, sorry, it's an old example, but it's the same information. Uh, next, please. Um, we identify what community solar is, how it works. We get, provide our website, tell you how much money you would receive. Next. And then solar for all for individual homes. Again, it's no cost. And these are the points that we try to hit on in all engagement. So these are just examples of two slides from slideshows that are, that are given in, in communities. Next, please. What if you don't qualify? Well, we have a solar tool online that allows market rate uh, um, property owners to check out the benefits of solar, see what their potential on their roof is. And then we can also provide guidance on identifying vendors for that as well. So next, please. So that is it for me. And uh, I think, yes, we'll take questions at the end. Appreciate it. So passing it along to Ingemar. Thank you, Emil. It's I'm Ingemar Matthiasen. We work with Northwest Starting Borough up in Alaska. Um, the borough is approximately a thousand households in a size uh, area of, of the state of Vermont. There's 10 communities and we are um, been doing regionalization since about 2008 and nine. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so why are we here? Go to the next slide. It's a survival issue. Background, of course, is that the outside oil levels, you've seen these numbers before. Uh, it was way high in 2008 when we started this project with the Energy Summit. And we are now been dropping down 
to about half the price of what it was in 2008. Next slide. However, that's not happened in our borough. We went from 2008 at about $5 average to now over $10 average. So the logistics and changing things, inflation and, and, and the environmental issues is now taking over and making it super expensive. And it's definitely on survival mode now, even worse than 2008. Next one. Fuel prices as of 2024, the red ones are where we're at at this point. One community ambler is actually at $18 a gallon at this point. All these prices will increase in the next two weeks when the new bar just comes up our, our ways. We know it with at least 50 cents per gallon. Next one. And electric prices, of course, reflect accordingly. You can see no attack at the bottom at the dollar 13. 14 uh, per kilowatt hour. And that's what our latest project that I will talk about in a little bit. So next one. In 2008, we created the steering committee and that has been going on twice a year. So this is the, the main community engagement for all, 10, all 1000 households. Um, we have one or two representatives from each community. There are, there are 11 communities total. And we meet twice a year to uh, ratify the energy plan that we have put together. And we're and basically steering the whole region into the future uh, by engaging all possible stakeholders in the, in the program. Next one. Here is our progression so far. 10% decrease of imported diesel fuels by 2025, 25% by 2030, and 50% by 2050. An ambitious goal for way far out where everything actually is so dependent on diesel fuel and, and gasoline. Next one. To get there, we have to go diesel off. So next one. Single focus was in 2008 to 2012 was to stabilize the cost of electricity by developing the local energy resources as much as possible. Anything we could find that we were looking for. Projects were funded and implemented by the electric utilities to offset the direct use of diesel fuel. The cost to the households per kilowatt did not change in the communities that receives PCE funding. This is an equalization program in Alaska that make sure that all households across Alaska has about the same electric rate up to 500 or at this point 750 kilowatt hours. The average in Alaska right now for all the households is 23 cents per kilowatt hour under that program. But as we built these alternate energy projects, the, that allocation decreased in the communities um, because of how the fund is structured. Next one. In 2008 to 2012, uh, we were building wind projects primarily to offset the diesel fuel. In the fine print in 2008, it says as a condition of the grant, independent power producers will agree to sell energy resources for electricity and heat at cost-based rate for the economic life of the project. If, if we had seen that in 2008, we probably would have already turned these projects into community projects. As it is, it's 2023, and we are just now going to turn these turbines over to the tribe and to the households so they can receive the direct benefits from them and not lose their PCEs, which has been basically not recovered through all these years. Next one. You can see a little bit here on the difference if you have a behind the meter operation. Let's look at the Shungnak one on top. Behind the meter value for 200,000 kilowatt hours, $51,000. But under, under IPP management, selling it to the utility, the IPP takes in $112,000 that actually is recovered instead of being lost and distributed to the households. Next one. We're celebrating 10 years now, 250,000 gallons saved. This is by solar only since we started it in 2013. Primarily 50,000 gallons were directly contributed by, by the water plants that you can see picture of at the bottom. And we had to be very innovative building the systems as the sun, of course, above the Arctic Circle uh, stays up for the six months, but it stays up all day long. Like right now up there, it's total sunlight. And the arrays that are built at 180 degrees circular are 
having very nice performance um, uh, curves for being able to be nice and uh, happily operating together with the generator systems. Next one. So in 2020, um, we had the first community array, kind of. It was a utility array put into Kotzebue, and it, it, was, it saved up 58,800 gallons uh, as of today. They have actually doubled that this year, so they are now at the megawatt of power. It's still a utility array, though. In 2021, we put together the first community solar one, saving now about 20,000, it's 19,500 on the picture there, and has also produced 818 hours of diesel off operation where we were running two communities, uh, Shungnak and Kobo combined, uh, about 100 households, uh, totally clean off solar and, um, and uh, under 818 hours. So next one. So the transition was happening like in 2020, 2021. Next one. We started to look at each of them into independent power producers. Well, the communities can take control of their energy future and developing their local resources. And that creates buy-in and good relationship with the utility. And in the case of most of our utilities, uh, the utility is actually operated out of Anchorage and was considered an kind of an enemy for the small uh, households out there since they we're charging them all the time, but now being IPPs, they actually producing their own power, give it to the utility, and then they, of course, get charged for it. But the in between transaction, they end up with some extra money to use directly for the communities themselves. Uh, this sustains the PC support from the state of Alaska and stabilizes the cost. It's better economic, circular economy, and funding collected pays for further development. Of lo and local workforce expertise and the money stays in the community instead of sending the money to far off countries for oil. Next one. So what's the reason for going regional with all this? We have, we have 11 communities. Well, the regional support to apply for and manage the energy grants, including ac access down to Department en uh, of Energy and other funding. Economy of scale and increasing efficiency, small single projects are very expensive to operate. And if we operate it, regionally, we can bring down the cost. Um, and we can develop regional energy structures like intertice that we're looking at at this point, uh, wind, solar, hydro, and all of it combined, including that direct household involvement that we're talking about here, the IPP. The next one. It also creates administrative help for independent power producers for the calculations of PCE, utility rates, and billing. There's job creation, workforce, and development that the borough is providing. The region speaks as one voice and can advocate on behalf of the PCE in the, in the, and also participate in the statewide energy policy. And this creates the energy security that is needed to stop the increasing cost of energy and hedge against the fuel increases and supply disruptions. Next one. So the Shungnak IPP project that, um, that was awarded the 223 um, kilowatt of AC using 550 panels, Blue Planet environmentally friendly LFP batteries, uh, capable of holding the communities for two hours with, uh, without generators or solar power. Uh, it was completed in uh, September 2021, and the total project cost of 2.3 million, money coming from um, USDA high energy cost grant, and in-kind village improvement fund and uh, borough funds itself at the, at the million dollars. Next one. The example functions like this. The grant opportunity happened uh, from USDA high energy cost grant and it was secured by the two tribes by allowing the borough map to apply on behalf of the communities. So the whole region works together on this and we constantly are combining all stakeholders into grant opportunities and project opportunities. Uh, the two communities are interconnected with a power line, so they benefit both. They became a combined IPP between two different communities of a total of about 100 households that are in that combined IPP now. And there was a power purchase agreement executed by the utility AVAC and them. And then AVAC pays for the solar power and recovered the cost partly from the PCE fund. 
and another MOA executed with North Historic Borough for the help with administration and investment of the funds. And an energy fund is now established for the communities. So there is a rainy day fund invested in the stock market that actually grows as they don't need to use it at the moment. Uh, meanwhile, funds are dispersed for insurance, maintenance, and, event, and, and more build out of the solar array. Next one. Okay, so the Sunny Awards are there, and uh, that's how we got recognized everywhere. Really appreciate that. Next one. The financials ended up at about 100,000 for uh, the Shunak project. Next one. And we're building the NOATAC IPP project as we speak. It'll be commissioned in a couple of months here. So that's our most expensive community. Next one. And this one is starting up for 2024. Um, it's an ambitious project uh, to build a very large solar array for the Selawick operation and also repop that I will talk about here in a minute. Next one. There is the five-year plan IPP full build-out that we're looking at. Uh, we're trying to leverage $57 million to do this. And uh, the, this will be the total offsets of diesel fuel combined. And all of the communities will become independent power producers at that point and um, operating through the steering committee. Next one. And there's the organizational structure we put in place for this. And I let it speak for itself pretty much. It's overseen by the steering committee on the left and the borough and the NANA uh, Regional Corporation, which is the, the tribal operation in the re region, uh, makes this happen. So basically this, these are tribal operations. We will have 11 of them all operating within three to four more years. Next slide. And then going forward, um, Hopefully the energy plans will never be completed. And the policy is, do we develop energy resources just for short time profits or do we develop local energy resources that can sustain the region for the foreseeable future and create a cleaner environment for our children? And I think that's it, one more. Thank you. Great. Um... Thank you all three of you for sharing more about these projects. And I think something that is um, kind of reflected for me is how unique your projects are to the place and the partners like in your region and in your area. I think that speaks to like the engagement part is really, or the um, uh, procedural and distributive justice is tailoring the projects to your um, specific area. Um, I usually learn a lot from like individual, like the stories that come out of the projects. And I'm wondering if we go a little bit more into that engage your process of engagement, if you had, um, certain stories on, um, sometimes it's fun to hear about the thing that was like in your effort to engage a partner or to, uh, you know, I get subscriptions or to deploy the project, if there were certain stories where you were like, wow, that thing really did not work. <laughs> or this thing, this is the solution that we came up with that works for our people. Um, I wonder if, if there is something, a story you could tell about that level of engagement. I could probably answer it a little bit on my end. Um, so in the beginning, when we started this, all the communities wanted to have an energy authority, something that actually was powerful enough to just on its own create um, a new future they wanted. Of course, none of the entities out there wanted that. Creating a new uh, political entity was just not the way to go. And, and we decided to just real quick drop that issue and try to just keep the steering committee going with total um, engagement. If people wanted to, they just needed to attend. And then slowly but surely we got buy-in from everybody by being totally open for all entities that wanted to participate in this. And that eventually brought it down to household level. Uh, 
I'll add too, um, in that vein that, um, that ongoing engagement, I guess, specific stories or examples um, in aggregate, they, I think for us, come back to um, communities that have felt put upon and not uh, particularly listened to in the past have um, kind of benefited from, from our desire to really engage those folks and not to, for example, we have a, a 15 acre site, uh, it's called Oxen Run Community Solar, and it was a degraded brownfield um, for 30 plus years. And the community did not um, at the time understand the value of solar, wasn't particularly interesting to them. They wanted affordable housing, they wanted um, you know, shopping, et cetera. And through a process of you know, having a discussion with the community for about a year, um, came to consensus that this was probably the best fit considering the, the pollution that was there and the, the cleanup that would be involved. Um, but having folks that worked on that project um, and others through Grid Alternatives and, and other partners actually come back and say, yes, I have a job in the solar industry or I'm, I'm doing field work and campaigning um, on climate change and that was through this initiative or we benefit from this program and now I can actually work on installing systems. Those I think are, are generally the thing that, that motivates uh, you know, a lot of our team um, to keep going because there are real um, tangible benefits that we see throughout the community especially when you have a an agency shirt on or a vehicle people want to talk and say hey that you're the solar for all people so that's that's really cool um and helps to get the word out to again expand uh, uh the benefits to more people um that's great uh answer emil and I'll, I'll try to give our perspective briefly um you know, you, you said it took a year for the planning of that that one project in in uh, your community, and um, that's probably comparable of what it takes for us to scope and plan and fund it, any project like this. And um, you know, really authentic engagement with respect to this Blackfeet uh, community solar project was was showing up uh, in the community because we had staff from BEF based in Portland, Oregon. We had Grid Alternatives tribal staff based in Denver. We had a very remote uh, community um, where our project was on the Blackfeet Reservation. And you know, we had we had people fly out and, and visit and commit to be there for, for weeks and months during the installation, visiting uh, tribal energy reviews in, in Denver. Um, and you know, that uh, relationship building was so important to kind of really figure out what gaps partners can fill, who can lead what, um, what is the best, best path uh, to success. Um, and, you know, there were strong partners on the ground as well, uh, as I mentioned, with the Hart Butte School and the Glacier Electric Cooperative and the Blackfeet Community College. These are all organizations that are staffed by the community members and have you know relatives at, at respective organizations. And so being as inclusive as we could in involving all of those organizations in the planning really kind of um, resulted in a project that was very responsive to the community needs. These are all really um, kind of cool examples of how, but yeah, all of your examples are are really cool about how you're able to like over time, over time develop the relationships that then result in the benefits that we're looking for from the start. So I think that like long, long time frame that you're you're giving is is an important element of that, like the authenticity really does require, you know, the building trust over time. Um uh on the flip side, so I'm going to ask a, a question kind of on the flip side of that. A lot of what we, you know, at, at Initiative for Energy Justice think about with like from the from the policy side is in some sense how to mandate something like this. How do you mandate community benefits? How would you mandate an authentic, you know, engagement process that isn't really, that is always customized? It's tailored to the specific place and the partners involved. Um, could you, do you have maybe ideas or reflections on, of the process that you all have experienced, is there something in there 
that you could um, either incentivize the process that you undertook, the process or the, the programs, um, or mandate something like, we, we sometimes talk about community benefit agreements as a way to structure engagement. So do you have something in that realm of what in your process of authentic engagement do you think would be possible to mandate or scale from a replicable process? I'll take a quick stab. Um, so because our entire program was mandated, um, again, that was 2016, we took about a year to design it and include it in a stakeholder process um, that was specifically called upon to, to incorporate all of those voices. Um, so we are fortunate in that regard and that's been a direction I think a lot of our agencies have, have been doing for at least a decade at this point. Um, so that was, I guess, an easy kind of requirement. Um, that said, it's now you know stretching to other other agencies and offices that, that don't have the, or serve the populations that we did. So it's kind of a natural fit for it to be, um, you know, a, a legislative mandate for us, but then the implementation is always, you know, doubles in the details. So, so getting all of those, um, the aspects of ensuring equity and diversity and inclusion and, and everything else that, it, that's kind of a nebulous phrase for, for some people, but it's kind of core to the way that our program operates um, because it's, we had to establish what the demographics were and where those populations are and what their unique characteristics are and how do you provide outreach to them. And the, the primary way to do that is to actually go into the community and talk to people um, and say, what would you like to be required in these uh, initiatives or these programs? So as they're updated, we try to make them, you know, even more equitable as time goes on. It's not just a static, you know, delivery of, a, of an initiative. Um, and really listening and not, again, having it be an imposition of our own preferences. While we say what we might prefer for district government property, um, we still want to hear what the community has to say. And through that, they have always asked for requirements for certain things like uh, small businesses or, uh, you know, women and minority owned businesses to be part of the contracting team, et cetera. So we're, that's a natural fit for us and, and hopefully other uh, organizations and, and governments kind of move in that direction as well. Just a follow-up question for you, Emil. Was your agency or um, like any of the people you work with now involved in designing the, the statute or the program initially? Yes. So we have a policy function and, um, you know, the mayor is the, the mayor's office is separate from from the legislature, but we work very closely in the drafting of, of rules and regulations that we have to then implement and abide by. So that's also a, a, a good position, I think, to, to be in, if, if possible. I'll, I'll jump in, and I, I would agree, and I'm, I'm quite jealous of the environments that uh, Ingemar and Emil are operating in. Um, you know, solar is a lot easier to do uh, when your cost of energy is 50 cents a kilowatt hour, or, you know, um, maybe half of that in, in D.C., whereas we have some utilities in the Pacific Northwest where a residential retail rate is two cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, so, you know, it's much more challenging to do solar, uh, depending on your geography. And so my answer to most questions these days is money, you know, like that's, that's what you need to enable, um, you know, a, a broad rollout or, or scaling. Um, and it's not just money for projects to subsidize projects to make them cost effective. If we're talking about meaningful benefits and engagement, money and resources to the community, to the community-based organizations, to the outreach, you know, to capacitate and fund that, that engagement is an important element. And, you know, the, the policy mechanisms Emil mentioned are, are fantastic to do that, but we don't have that across the country. We have it in, you know, different, different pockets, um, but that's definitely a big part of any program. If you want meaningful engagement, you definitely have to have the money or the resources there to enable that for, whoever's administering the program, but also for communities to engage with that program. Oh, 
I'll leave some space if Ingomar wants to address some structural mandates, but you don't have to. Okay, well, I can, I can chime in on a little one there, sorry. Um, so uh, allowing, in, in our state, allowing the IPPs to exist all the way down to community base has changed uh, the, the discussions quite a bit. And um, the state is also talking about the renewable portfolio standard. That kind of mandate from state level could say, for example, that a certain percentage uh, has to be renewable energy for each household and could uh, you know, accelerate transition into renewable power. We're struggling with trying to put together something that actually works within a timeline that, that's needed. But um, uh, a top-down approach needs to be continuously worked upon so that there is incentives uh, to for the utilities to play ball. Most utilities don't necessarily want to do that. It's easy to just keep status quo. Mm -hmm. Sure is. <laughs> um, I will take one question from the Q&A for Emil about your Brownfield site example. And the question is, could you say a little more about how you balance the efforts to educate the community while also ensuring you're not imposing a preference that might still not be their priority? Right, that's a great question. Um, one, one, I guess, big piece of it is, um, again, our partners are great. We try to identify individuals and organizations that are, you know, really core to the operations of a particular neighborhood or community. Um, going to them first, asking what their specific um, needs might be with respect to opportunities or, or projects that we have. Um, that may be electric vehicle chargers and, you know, site acquisition and placement of those. Or it could be, um, could you talk to, you know, the churches in your community to see who would like free solar panels? And at this point, it's it's not a, a disbelief situation. It's just a, oh, okay, well, let's find DOE. They either have the money or they'll find some for us and they'll find the partners. So, so we have a good reputation at this point with that. Um, so it's really not a balancing act so much now as it was in that instance, which again was more, um, are you putting a power plant here that is going to give us cancer or, you know, some, some other, you know, detrimental impacts that when folks don't have things, they, they're or not familiar with it. They just want to understand kind of the, the, um, what it can do for your community. We have, you know, a lot of issues and challenges with, with gentrification and, um, you know, social mobility and a lot of kind of overarching factors that all have to be dealt with at the very front end and openly and honestly before you even get to the, you know, for putting the first, uh, you know, rack mount on a roof. It's it's covering all of that initially to, to build that trust. And then our own preferences from maybe a climate perspective um, maybe carry a little more, more weight because the communities understand that these are our goals um, on the environmental side, air quality, et cetera, uh, improvements, um, energy savings, but also what is it that you need in your day-to-day -day lives and how can we kind of layer all of those, those benefits? Um, uh, you know, fortunately, again, we can talk to other agencies and deliver a portfolio of, of, of benefits. So, so we don't really have that challenge um, anymore. And I wish, you know, all governments were kind of able to, to structure their programs that way, um, where it's very easy to, to kind of cross pollinate ideas and information. Um, and people really feel, yes, I talked to 10 different agencies this week and everyone was responsive and I feel my needs are being met, so. I love that. Thank you, Emil. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna switch to one more question about innovation, since we're talking about innovation and engagement. Um, my question would be around, what are um, some of the innovations you think are most important to scaling a program like yours? So, um, you know, some things that struck me were, uh, you know, the space constraints in DC or the kilowatt rate in the Northwest. What would you imagine if you were trying to do more projects like yours, 
uh, would be some of the, give me a silver bullet. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you could come up with one, what might be that, that innovation? I don't know if I can use money again, but um, that's probably high up on the list. Um, I mean, that, that helps uh, projects overcome a lot of challenges, but I'll, I'll, I think the best innovation is likely um, virtual net metering. You know, when we talk about community solar mm -hmm. and we talk about the households that might lack access, whether it's, you know, shading or home ownership or um, financial barriers, um, virtual net metering is a, a policy mechanism that is probably the most effective at reaching uh, some of these households. So um, that, that's a big part of any successful community solar program. And that's one of the biggest tools that we've seen from our experience to be able to um, kind of pair the resources and the savings with, with the households that, that need it most. Yeah, I, I actually agree with that one. Uh, we're, we're trialing a couple of um, VNM projects now. And that I think combined with a silver bullet, if there were one for interconnection, um, actually speeding those up, um, those queues. I know, you know, people across the country are, are having those issues. Um, and then being able to, at least for us in, in a, or urban environments, you could, you could scale and kind of aggregate, you know, projects across your kind of geographic range. Again, we, we would love to do really big lower cost systems um, and just are not physically able to do that. So that's where V&M, uh, you know, comes in. And, and again, hopefully much faster interconnections. I could add to that, that um, I think I think batteries will play a big role for us. It certainly changed everything to have batteries available for our project on microgrids, but even on household size uh, units that are hooked to the regular 48 grid, um, balancing out the system with batteries versus having just solar being more and more um, you know, basically unstable without them, the batteries has to be there and faster the battery technology advances and imp gets implemented by the utilities and I would say also in the households eventually. Um, I could foresee, you know, 10 years from now that every household would have a, ba a backup battery that balances out anything coming from that household or from the, um, from the solar community grids so that the microcontrollers that eventually creates this big smart grid, they all gonna to talk to each other and the internet is a very big factor in all that. I'm Whoa. sorry, can I add too? That just reminded me, yes, microgrids are um, something else we're very interested in and are beginning to pilot. So thanks Ingemar for, for the reminder there. Uh, well, thank you all so much for coming up with our, our silver bullets <laughs> problems to solve. Um, I will turn it back over to Ariel to close us out. Thank you so much to our uh, our panelists and, and sharing more about uh, projects in so many different parts of the country and, and contexts. Thank you. One second, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, looks good. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our um, presenters today. And thank you, Michaela, for facilitating that great conversation. I really appreciate all of the insights you shared. And I'm really excited to see how your projects continue, uh, projects and programs continue to develop in the years to come. Um, before we close out the webinar today, I just wanted to share that we have one more webinar in this series coming up on July 25th, which will focus on community ownership as a topic. Um, so if you're interested in joining that one, you can still register. Um, all of the previous four webinars are also available on our landing page. You can access the slides and recordings. So if you missed one of them and would like to uh, watch it, it is available to you there. And one last reminder, which I mentioned earlier, but our um, 2023 Sunny Awards for Equitable Community Solar um, application process is closing in two days on July 14th. And again, we're looking to recognize projects or programs that include these meaningful benefits that we're highlighting in this webinar series today 
So looking at um, projects and programs that really achieve strong low income access, household savings, resilience, grid benefits, community ownership, innovative workforce development, and then the pieces we talked about today around equitable community engagement and innovation. Um, so if you have any new projects or programs that you would like to submit, please get those in within the next two days. Um, and with that, I thank you all for your time. Um, you'll be able to access the slides and recording on our webinar. Um, and thank you again to the speakers um, and to NREL who hosted the webinar. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day today. Thank you very much. Thanks, take care. Thank you.